Welcome, everybody, to the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Uh, my name is Adam Ward, Director of Studies, and it's my pleasure to be chairing this discussion meeting considering the direction in which South Sudan uh, is heading. As everybody here will know, South Sudan gained its independence in July of 2011 and embarked immediately on a very uh, challenging process of state building and institution building of uh, efforts to develop the economy and, and society, and also, of course, to begin to foster uh, international relationships of a formal diplomatic uh, character. But also, of course, we know that um, the country has made the headlines in the last month or two uh, by virtue of the rebellion that began in December and the peace talks that are now currently underway to try and address some of the fundamental political differences which have been thrown uh, into public view and into uh, the spotlight. So the purpose of the meeting uh, here today is to have uh, a first-hand, a detailed uh, assessment of um, the nature of the, uh, the talks that have followed the ceasefire uh, agreement, uh, what are the obstacles that need to be overcome, and what are some of the longer-term opportunities that South Sudan can uh, seize uh, and grasp if those uh, structural problems can be successfully overcome, as we must hope uh, they will. Um, we're very pleased to uh, be uh, welcoming here today for uh, a key address uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation of the Government of South Sudan, Dr. Barnaba Mariel uh, Benjamin, who has been in London for uh, calls on the Foreign Office with uh, senior officials here in the United Kingdom and has had a very busy schedule of consultations during his, his time here. Uh, he is um, a member of parliament and somebody with a very uh, detailed and distinguished uh, record of ministerial um, responsibilities. So, sir, we're very um, happy to see you here. Uh, you've agreed to address us in detail for about 15 uh, or 20 minutes or so. And then what we'll do is we will turn things over for five minutes each to two discussants that we have here on the panel today. Uh, they will speak in the order in which they appear on the agenda. So we'll begin with James Copnell who is a former BBC correspondent, has a book coming out, or maybe it's already out? Just about to come out. Just about out. Uh, Sudan and South Sudan's Bitter and Incomplete Divorce is the title. And then we'll turn to Thomas Mawan Murtat, uh, who's a South Sudanese um, analyst, for some of his uh, comments and observations. Minister, uh, the lectern is yours. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, yes. I think I'll go to the podium. Great. Far better so that I can see everybody and you can also see me. Too. Excellent. Um, um, well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm extremely delighted uh, to be invited at this institute, International Institute for Strategic Studies. And I thank uh, the director, Adam, for this opportunity. And I'm equally pleased uh, to have our good friend, James Copnell, uh, who has been a BBC correspondent uh, in the Republic of South Sudan and has traveled across the country. I'm sure he has seen a lot. And uh, Thomas Gordon, it's nice to see you here. Uh, but I also thank you for turning up because I've seen the number of people and the institutions that you represent are relevant to what we have today in South Sudan. And one is also happy with the cold weather, you could still make it. My sympathies for you. <laughs> uh, I was hopeful if there was a way to bring the nice warmth of Juba to you here, I, I bet you would forget about the problems of South Sudan and begin buying my heat and my warmth. To talk about South Sudan in 20, 15 to 20 minutes is extremely a difficult thing to do because the issues are numerous. So what I will try to do in order to give the opportunity of discussion is maybe instead of turning it out into a complete monologue on my side, we do it rather than a discussion forum so that all of us can contribute. And to discuss issues which are strategic, it is important for us also to know this country, how strategically important it is. South Sudan 
It's a huge country. It's about 650 square kilometers of land, bigger than France. It is surrounded by six countries. To the north of it, we have the Sudan. And to the east of it, we have Ethiopia. To the south of it, we have Kenya, Uganda, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and the Central African Republic to southwest. So this is a country in the heart of the continent, surrounded by six countries. It therefore has a regional strategic importance, because what happens in South Sudan definitely will impact on the neighbors that we have. The internal policies that the Republic of South Sudan has to conduct must also be related to the good neighborliness that we should portray in trying to have relationship with six countries. It's a polygamous uh, marriage politically, I would say, because to relate to all to these different countries, uh, you need to have policies that are friendly, uh, policies that are tied to your economy, policies that are tied to your security, and policies that are tied uh, to your existence in what you do in order to promote development in your country. Internally, South Sudan has been a country gifted with enormous resources. That's why we call it the virgin territory of Africa. We call it the virgin territory of Africa in terms of the resources that we have. What are these resources? These resources have regional interests. They have equally international interests. And you talk about oil. As many people amongst you here are aware, that oil could be a curse. And we have seen it in so many countries. We have seen it in, within the context of Africa. We have seen it what it means to have oil in the incidences of Libya, the Arab Spring that we are seeing today. We have seen it in Nigeria, the Boko Haram, and the rest of it. We have seen it in countries like Angola. And in terms of other resources like gold, which is in South Sudan, in, which are not yet exploited in terms of, of nickel, in terms of iron, in terms of diamond, in terms of, of uranium, what have you. These are resources that are proven but not yet exploited. So this generates a great deal of interest. We have equally the agricultural potential of the Republic of South Sudan, that every bit of that land is fertile, and our late leader used to describe it as the, or, the largest organic farm in the world today, because you could produce products which are also cash products that can be sold internationally, as well products that can be due, I mean, consumed locally and at the level of the region. In terms of rainfall, you have a climate, an equatorial zone where it rains throughout the year, and there is a tropical zone which have eight months of rainfall, and a savanna territory towards the north of it where it can rain four to five, five to six months of the year with enormous underground water, and fortunately or unfortunately, the River Nile, the White Nile, which is the longest part of River Nile, which is the longest river in the whole world as we know it. These are resources you have that need to be exploited. And finally, you have the historical aspect of it, of the country itself. South Sudan, since 1865, visited by pioneers that have come mostly from Europe, particularly the United Kingdom. And I would quote you a few examples. As I said the other day at Chatham, you have Sir Samuel Baker, when he visited South Sudan in 1865, he was amazed of the beautiful land that he has found. And he describes it as a perfect garden of Eden in terms of the terrain and in terms of the people that he found. He described them to be friendly. He described them to be one of the best friendly and hospitable people he has ever found. And when Sir William Charles Gordon came as the governor in 1869, 1870. He was able to administer that territory. And he said that this piece of land could have been an independent state. 
I'm sure the Whitehall did not listen to his advice. I think it is important to know this part of the history. In addition to the terco egyptian invasion of the country of 1820, 1821, in which the exercise of that entry, that invasion, concentrated on three things, and that is looking for black gold, white gold, and yellow gold. The white gold is the elephant tusks. Thank God we still have our elephants on because they were mostly targeted. The second was the black gold, which was the slave trade, and the yellow gold was the real gold that some of the women might be wearing here. So you can see this is a territory that has been exposed to terrible history. I need this part because if we discuss what we are doing now with the present issue, we must go back to how far this country has come. These are people who have been exposed to terrible historical confrontation. Then comes in, of course, Lord Kitchener of 1898, who established the modern Anglo-Egyptian Sudan, where both South Sudan and North Sudan were assumed to be one nation. It was assumed, I use the word assumed because it is a specific. They were put up together because there were many views that South Sudan could be a part of East Africa or South Sudan could be an independent state or South Sudan could be annexed with North Sudan to form what we call the Anglo-Egyptian Sudan. And all these arguments, the indigenous people of the country did not participate their opinion was not given any listening. No doubt we have problems today. No doubt we have a war that continued soon after independence in 1956. And in 1955, four months before the British left the country, Anyanya one started. And the message was clear that they wanted an independent state of their own. Of course, in those days of Macmillan and before Macmillan, uh, Sir Winston Churchill said he is not out here to dismantle Her Majesty's empire. And there was no any independence of any country that came out until when Macmillan came and he expressed the wind of change. And by 1956, Sudan was the first African country that became independent. But before its independence in 55, the people of South Sudan protested. And that brought Anyanya one. I'm sure Jill Lass of Africa Confidential, I'm seeing uh, sitting here, is very much knowledgeable about these things. And from 1955, that continued to 1972. You are talking 17 years of civil war in which the people of South Sudan lost about half a million to a million lives. And that was a terrible war. We ended up with Addis Ababa Peace Agreement that recognized the identity of the people of South Sudan. And we had a regional government that continued from 72 to 1983. And within those 10 years, South Sudan was able to change its presidential leadership over 10 times without shooting weapons, without shooting with any sound of gun. They were able to have different presidents from different ethnic groups to an extent that South was able even to elect those who came from ethnic background that could not make a constituency in a parliament. And examples are, you had a Dinka president, you had a Madi president, you had a Zande president, you have a, a Nuer president, uh, you can go on, you have even Abdallah Rassas, who by nature, whose only connection with the South, that his mother was only South Sudanese, but he came mainly from the North, he was able to become the president of South. So this idea that the ethnic confrontation, the tribal aspect of it, could have surfaced at that area. And nobody will quote to me here the African countries where they have changed their leadership several times, bringing different ethnic groups. I think this background for this institute is important for us if you relate to the present crisis. By 83, because there was no honor to the Disababa Agreement, we launched once more into the SPLM, SPLA, 1983 to 2005. By 94, by 89, actually, we started negotiating with various governments in Khartoum. And the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, which was a piece of good agreement, one country, two systems, a unique system 
that you cannot find anywhere, we were able to sign the comprehensive agreement that identified and recognized the identity of the South, both in terms of its natural identity, its economic potential, and also his, its, its own historical aspect. Now, we had a transitional and interim government from 2005 to 2011. And you know the havoc that we have gone through. By 2011, the people of South Sudan, in their various ethnic groups, of 64 ethnic groups, were able to actually vote 98.85 for a state of their own. A truly democratic decision of a people who have decided they would like to be a nation of their own. You are not telling me that the tribes did not exist by then. They still, in their tribal aspect, they were able to vote and tell the world, look, here we are, we are a nation. Now, we are two years old, a young nation, 194, 193 or 94, a member of the United Nations, 193, 193 at the United Nations member, a group of world family. We are part of the very young nation. And you are lucky to see a young nation. It's not usually, it's not usually easy to find a new country these days because most of them are old, 200 years old. Britain is how many since days of Cromwell up to now? Thousands of years, isn't it? Here you are, a young nation, the Republic of South Sudan, that voted 198.85. Now, the process, it is also wonderful that this young nation is beginning from the scratch. As we said, we are beginning from zero. We had got to build our institutions, executive institutions. We have to build legislat legislative institutions. We had to build also our, our, our judicial systems. We did not get our country like the independence of other African countries like Kenya, like Uganda, like Nigeria, like South Africa, because these countries, when the colonial administration left, the indigenous people walked into their offices. There were tables, there were chairs, there were shelves and files at the back of that process. They had files to refer to. For us, we had to build the offices, repair the broken windows, put in tables and chairs, form our civil service, form a, transform our guerrilla army into a national army, build a new police, meal ward. It's an extremely pioneer work. And that's why we describe ourselves, we are pioneers in our own country. And the goodwill, the international goodwill that we have, we have always been saying, let us work together to build this new nation. Build democratic processes. So what South Sudan needs, ladies and gentlemen, is not punishment. What South Sudan needs is assistance, is help to resolve its very deep challenges that it has. In a world of this of today that we hear, it is a global village. How global village it is, what global village it is, in our African context, in the village partnership, when you have no table salt at midnight, 12 o'clock, you come late at your home, you want to have a good meal, and you find that your dear wife forgot the salt this morning. So you said, dog, can you go to the next door? And that is 1 o'clock at night. People give us, you knock at the door, they open it for you, what do you want? I say, we need salt. Oh, yes, we have some. They give to you. That is the global village we understand, which is not internationally represented. So what we need is assistance, not punishment. What happened, it started as an argument, and in order to make my time correct, it's an argument, an arrangement at the level of the political party, the SPLM. The idea was to discuss and actually go through the documents, the constitution of the party, the manifesto of the party, and the code conduct of the party. That document was passed by the political bureau of the party, of which our present president is the president of the party, and the former vice president, Dr. Yak, is the second in the party, as well as second in the government. They passed those documents. Those documents went to the uh, Liberation Council. The National Liberation Council of the party, this is an elected body of the party that consisted about 134 members. In their discussions in passing the document, 128 endorsed the documents, but eight members that were led by the vice president disagreed, and therefore did not endorse. And the point of difference was the mode of election. 
in as far as the formation of the congresses of the parties were concerned. So although it started as a party argument, as a party debate, not really argument, uh, it, it turned out that the majority endorsed and the vice president didn't endorse. On the second day, the eight members did not attend the meeting, and by 9.50, in the night, the first guns were heard at the presidential guard. And that started. An attempt to take over the stores of the military, of the headquarters, they were repulsed by the royalists, the loyal forces, I mean, after repulsing them, on the, that was on the 15th, on the 16th it continued, they were repulsed, and therefore, the pronouncement made by the former vice president that on the 16th, that by midday he would be at the state house and would form his government, many other statements that he has released. Now, the division commander in Bor, as you have heard, you have heard a lot about Bor, expressed his allegiance to the vice president. And that's how Vice President Riyag Machar went to Bor to continue his, his, his struggle. And you find that the division commander of the unity state also expressed uh, his, uh, that is division four, expressed support, and this is within the army. So the struggle was within either the national army or a part of the national army that became mutinous and supported the vice president. Now when this incident happened, especially in Juba, when they were repulsed, and the government, the, 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 the loyal forces were returning, some of them, indiscipline of them, actually targeted certain ethnic groups, particularly ethnic group in Juba. That's how the ethnic group was targeted, not by the whole army. It was some of the indisciplined army, and you know soldiers everywhere, when you send them to war, some of them get out of focus. And that's how the ethnic group was targeted in Juba. The government did not sit by. They have formed now an investigation committee led by <coughs> chief, all the, the previous chief justice, and some of these cases are being investigated. Already we have arrested about 100 of them. Also among the rebel forces in the Kobo area, also some of the rebel forces who were the mutinous part of the National Army also targeted the Dinka ethnic group. And that's how the Dinkas were killed in that place, including the two peacekeepers. So what I would like to tell you is this, this ethnic element being played up is not among the civilian population. It is not the ordinary citizens. Neighbors living by sight are not targeting and killing themselves like what we have seen in Rwanda in the case of the genocide that happened in Rwanda. I think this needs to be put into context. Of course, those who have conducted this, the only civilized way to deal with these issues is to form legal structures, investigation, so that you can be able, in fact, to, to, to be able to, to punish them. Now, so from a debate in the army, a debate in the party went on, resulted in a rebellion, a sort of an attempted coup, that's why uh, I don't know, in English terms, if you have somebody trying to change a democratically elected government the, through the use of force, the term which is used as far as we know and as far as we are taught in our schools and in colleges, it's called a coup. And that's what exactly what it is. What confirms it to be a coup, because the vice president, in the areas he took control, he started appointing governors and trying to, 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 to express that he has now formed a new party. So it transformed into a rebellion. Now, a rebellion were the two states that he was in control of, that the capitals of those two states have been now recovered, including Malakal, which also a part of it that is now under full control of the government. Now, the region came in to process the Igat peace process. And the government agreed fully that this is a senseless war and that we agreed on four principles. First, direct dialogue without conditions. Two, cessation of hostilities. Number three, the release of the suspected uh, members of, the, of, of, of Dr. Riyaks who were suspected to be a part of the coup according to the laws of the Republic of South Sudan. And number four, the unhindered delivery of relief food to all areas covering South Sudan. And it is on that basis the cessation of hostilities was signed by both as well as the condition, as what they say, the status of detainees. In fact, they are not detainees. These they are not political detainees. These are suspected elements that are believed to have been involved in the coup. And I think this is a misnomer to call them political detainees. 
They, in fact, they are suspected coup makers. And I think this should be very, very clear. And since South became independent, we don't have any political prisoners in our prisons. You cannot find people locked up because they have committed some political crimes. Because South Sudan is based on multipartism within our constitution, and any citizen has a right of association if you want to form your party. So I believe uh, that this is a process. Now, to run quickly, maybe before I can see your time is running out. Now, as a result of this cessation of hostilities, the EGAT countries now are supposed uh, to have a modalities of monitoring and verification of where the both rebel forces, where they are, and the government forces are, so that the ceasefire can become effective. The talks have resumed, are supposed to have resumed yesterday, but because of certain logistical reasons, they will resume today. And while we are sitting this evening, I believe that they must have opened uh, this evening and in Addis Ababa. Of course, what is the way forward? The way forward, of course, the government, I can assure you as a member of the government of the Republic of South Sudan, that the government is committed to resolving this issue because the people of South Sudan need peace. And indeed, the government is committed to that program. Now, we have put down an agenda. The government of the Republic of South Sudan, what is the way forward? First, we agreed an unconditional ceasefire among the warring parties in the country as soon as possible. And we have gone ahead and we have signed the cessation of hostilities. Two, humanitarian assistance to the affected citizens wherever they are in the country, even in rebel areas, while an immediate uh, focus and effort to return the internally displaced, what we call the IDPs, uh, back their homes will be given quick attention. And the government is serious about that. Number three, that a grand national peace and political dialogue in the country with full participation of the, uh, the, of the, of the detainees. Detainees will be subjected to due process of the law later. That's how the seven detainees, uh, to use your term, to us they are suspected coup makers. They were released, investigations were carried out, and it was felt that the president had a constitutional sort of intervention where he was able uh, to release these detainees on bail. Number four, a continuation of investigations into the crisis and hold the people accountable for atrocities committed. The results and legal process shall be shared fully with the public. We're going to be very transparent about the investigations of these cases of atrocities. Number five, a presidential pardons and amnesty shall be part of peace efforts within the laws of the country and that will come out within the context of the discussion and the environment created during the negotiation process. Number six is the establishment of a National Peace and Reconciliation Council, which shall reach all corners of South Sudan. It will involve the whole society sector, including the churches, including the, the elders, including the civil society organizations, so that it becomes comprehensive. Seven is to review and strengthening of government institutions in the country, particularly the army, law enforcement agencies, judiciary, and anti-corruption measures. That is, we are going to have actually a complete reform within our security sector, reform within our judicial sector, or reform within all our civil service structure. And number eight, preparation for elections in 2015, okay, by conducting national census, registration of all political parties and voter registration list. This is the way forward, how we believe this issue will be resolved. Now, if you ask me what is the fate of former vice president, yes, it must be based on democratic solutions in that country. And that is number one. Any citizen is allowed to contest to become the president of, this, of that country. If he cannot gain the leadership of the SPLM as a party, he has a second option, that he can form his own party and contest independently in 2015. And if the people of South Sudan who have the decision to elect who should lead the Republic of South Sudan according to our constitution, so be it. But there's no way the decision for the leadership of the country is not in the hands of our present leadership, is not in the hands of the SPLM, it is in the hands of the ordinary people, the ordinary citizens of the Republic of South Sudan. And I think we need to get this message very, very, very clearly. Ladies and gentlemen, I think I've spoken enough. I have cut through here and there. 
If I was to be given chance, Adam, next time, I will need three hours so that, <laughs> so that I can put some meat on some of these details I have shared with you. But my message to you is this, ladies and gentlemen, before I conclude, that first, my government is determined to continue to lead efforts to reach a peaceful solution to the violence that affects so many people across our three states in Upper Nile region. That is the Zhongli state, the Upper Nile state, and the Unity state. We have got 10 states. The other seven states are normal. We have a population of 12 million in the Republic of South Sudan. I'm sure in the next census, the numbers could be higher. But it is these three states that have problems. Finally, South Sudan is still a destination of investment. And we would encourage investment so that these resources are exploited for the benefit of the people of South Sudan that will enhance the development that we so need. Now, the President of the Republic of South Sudan, General Salva Kiir Mayadid, is determined to address the issues of human rights concerns, including the violation by members of the armed forces and to curb indiscipline in the armed forces and improve awareness of human rights obligations. And that's why we have got now the former Chief Justice has been appointed in order to investigate all these cases. I thank you so much for the few minutes you have given to me, and I hope to see you next time. Come to Juba. It is warm. It is calm. There is no gunfire in Juba. Thank you. Sorry for taking more minutes. Sir. Minister, not at all. You, you crammed an awful lot into the, uh, the few minutes as opposed to the three hours that we allocated uh, to you. You set things in historical perspective. You located South Sudan in its wider strategic neighborhood. You dwelt on the importance of South Sudan from a resource perspective and therefore from the perspective of its potential geo-economic um, uh, Im importance, as we might say here at the Institute. And I think we want to uh, continue where you really uh, ended, which was to look to the future as much as we can. I was very struck by uh, your description on the one hand of the, the solidarity within South Sudan on the question of independence and the level of support. And you mentioned also the tremendous international goodwill which exists uh, towards the, the project, contrasting with what you also described, which was fault lines and fissures within elements of the political elite, within elements of the armed forces, and spilling over into uh, ethnic uh, dimensions as well. So I think in the time that we have left, uh, we should really turn uh, to the future. Um, the requirements of an effective implementation of the ceasefire, which you dwelt on, and then also the key question is, what do the talks need to be able to uh, achieve uh, to achieve some sort of a permanent uh, resolution of the, the fissures that you outlined as well. So James, perhaps you can lead us off on some of those questions. Yes, thank you so much. Thanks for uh, the kind words, particularly from the minister. I won't be able to uh, equal them in the time uh, available, so I'll, I'll press on. I think uh, the point about everybody being united at the time of the referendum is a very important one, but I wonder to what extent people were united in their antagonism or enmity towards Khartoum and not uh, towards a constructive nation-building project, and whether the first couple of years after independence there was a lot of concentration, both by South Sudanese and by foreigners working in South Sudan, on state building, on building institutions, rather than uh, building a nation, rather than the sort of projects that will bring people together. And that's something that maybe uh, broader talks, which is something we can, we can come on to later, uh, would, would potentially need to address. I think it's worth pointing out that at the start of this crisis there was this political tension within the party. It was very obvious that Rek Machar wanted uh, to become chairman of the party and therefore presumably president of the country, and that everything within South Sudan, because of uh, the historical context, the political game is played within the SPLM, and I suppose to a lesser extent within the SPLA, but within the SPLM, within the party. And therefore what happens within the party is much more relevant than what happens with the opposition. And there was this political uh, context. There were the accusations of increasing authoritarianism by uh, President Salva Kiir. Uh, that was certainly the uh, Reg Mashar and other people's uh, line. The events of December the 15th, I think, are interpreted very differently by South Sudanese. Some see them as, as the minister has said, as an obvious coup attempt 
against Salva Kiir, and others are convinced that there was nothing like it at all, that this was an attempt to get rid of Rek Mishar and other people in opposition. And I don't suspect anything I say or maybe anyone else says at this point will convince those different camps uh, to change their perspective. But it is relevant that certainly among Western countries who do have a certain influence in South Sudan, they haven't been convinced by the coup narrative. And that's why Salva Kiir himself has said he's been disappointed that the African Union or the Americans haven't condemned the uh, alleged attempted coup. So that starting point and what exactly happened on December the 15th is, I think, uh, particularly significant. I'd be interested to hear more from the minister and other people in the audience, too, uh, about the regional role, which the minister suggested was so important, the strategic importance of South Sudan. And one of the big questions at the moment is the role of the Ugandan military. Now, Ugandan soldiers have been in South Sudan for a few years now, particularly looking for the LRA, uh, but their role changed uh, dramatically at the start of this crisis. They protected infrastructures in Juba and then got involved, as President Museveni said himself, within the fighting. And the rebels, uh, for understandable reasons, are against this, and the government says this is their absolute right as a sovereign nation to invite in who they want. What I'd be interested to know from the minister is, is he not worried about how eventually Sudan may react to this? Because my sense is, is that Sudan is not that keen on Ugandan troops in South Sudan near the Sudanese border. So although it may serve the interests of the South Sudanese government at the moment, is there a longer-term risk with the presence of Ugandan troops uh, on uh, South Sudanese soil uh, fighting alongside the SPLA against the rebels? I think we also have to come to the negotiations. Uh, the future role of Reg Mashar has been uh, alluded to, and that's certainly interesting. Again, I come back to the point that within South Sudanese politics in this post-independence period, you're inside the SPLM or you have little relevance. So Reg Mashar would lose a lot of his legitimacy if he broke away, if he formed a new party, if he attempted to contest the 2015 elections from, uh, without, from a different party. Ultimately, it may be that South Sudan needs another party, needs a genuine democratic debate, not just one within the SPLM, but within different political formations. But I think certainly in the short term, anyone breaking away from the SPLM would forfeit a lot of its chances for electoral success, uh, if, if nothing else. But to come back to these negotiations, which are at the moment are between the two warring parties with the possible involvement of heavyweight political figures who've been locked up, whether detainees or accused, depending on how you phrase it, and four are still lo locked up uh, in Juba. I think there's a clamor within South Sudanese society for, to move beyond this rather narrow set of characters at the talk. So that has failed in past negotiations within the United Sudan, that ultimately one might come up with some sort of political deal between the warring parties that would be dependent on uh, the military balance of the moment, but would that actually resolve the very deep problems ethnic problems, political problems, social problems, issues of national cohesiveness? Probably not. And so there is a provision for national reconciliation and for a broad-based approach, but I would be keen to see to what extent that will guide the process or rule the process in Addis Ababa, or whether it will be merely an addendum to the real talks between those who have the weapons. Um, Salva Kiir, one of the things he's most been known for is his big tent policy. And that involved offering amnesties to people who'd gone into rebellion. Uh, in 2006, you could argue that he uh, ended the possibility of an inter-Southern Sudan conflict by signing a deal with Paulino Matip and his forces. Uh, but by bringing in so many people with different uh, military loyalties, with different political perspectives, we have a very divided SPLA, the National Army, and we have a divided political class too. So is in the current, current context the big tent, is that over? Is there no more space for that sort of uh, policy? Has that been an error ultimately, or was it a necessary evil? Those are all things that I would uh, welcome further discussion on. And I think probably given the time, I'll end it there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, there's lots of useful points there, so I think... Uh... <laughs> 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 um, we, we will give you a few minutes now, I think, actually, just to respond to some of those. So that, some of that detail isn't lost, but the way I, I captured it was yeah. questions essentially about the attitude 
uh, and role of uh, Western countries, uh, Sudan's attitude towards uh, the Ugandan uh, factor, uh, whether the negotiations are being structured in quite the right way, uh, and in particular this uh, question about the, the big tent dynamic in those, in those talks. Um, uh, well, well, first of all, you don't mind I can sit here Please now. Um, I, 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 of course, I, I concur with most of the issues raised by, uh, by James. Uh, I think uh, he has done analysis on issues which are relevant. Uh, having said so, I would say on the issue of the authoritarianism by Selva Kiir, I don't think that, is, uh, that it, there is no authoritarian in the light of the way in which he has resolved some of the issues like uh, the amnesty he has given so much, the fact that he has allowed and contributed according to the policy of the SPLM, the multipartism in the country. Ladies and gentlemen, as we speak now, we have got 25 political parties. Uh, I think you, you can rarely find that in most of the African countries. That gives a chance, and the fact that our constitution is very clear, that it is the people of South Sudan in a democratic manner that have the authority and the right to choose their leaders and to reject them so should they choose so. What else can a leader do more than that? It must be institutionalized, it must be within the constitution and within the documents of a country. And I think Salva lives by that. Uh, his choice when he became the president of the, of, the, of the republic, it was through the choice of the SPLM as a party. And our party constitution gives right to the flag bearer of the party that is the chair of the party, the option of choosing the running mate. And he decided to choose uh, Riyak Bachar as the running mate. But within our constitution, it also gives the right to the president. Also, he has the, uh, the power and the authority to, 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 to actually fire his or her vice president. So it is within our constitutional uh, regulations. And even Dr. Riyak, when he was reshuffled out of the government, some of you calling it, you call it fire, but he was reshuffled like many people have been reshuffled. He said, yes, it was the prerogative of the president uh, to, to reshuffle me, that there's no problem with that. But equally, with the nature of all vice presidents throughout the world, I, I haven't heard one day the vice president of the United States trying to, uh, to, to, to criticize a, a president uh, uh, of the United States, Obama, uh, because he, he knows his position that one day he might become president himself, and he has to wait patiently until he's elected. So I think uh, we, we have also to give a, a sort of a, a green light to that. On the role of the United States, South Sudan has been cooperating with what we call the Troika. The Troika are three countries that have been with us throughout the struggle, who have always we have been working with them together as, as, as the goodwill and friendliness. That is the United States, the United Kingdom, and Norway. Because some of these countries have been with us since the days of the struggle. They have, we know that the United Kingdom has the traditional background of having been in that country. The United States was able, different administration from Bush and, and, and Clinton and all the rest have been trying to resolve the issue of South Sudan and therefore have been involved in humanitarian assistance and all that. And Norway has been with us since 1983 when we launched our struggle as a sympathetic part. Its own history also they had to break away from. Uh, as you know, they had to fight for their own independence, they understood us. So we are working with these countries. We call them partners. Not only that, the goodwill internationally, where we have what we call now the new compact, the new deal compact. This is a compact we have worked out with countries like Japan, with countries like, like uh, Norway, European Union. Uh, you can go on, countries like uh, uh, China and the rest which together work with the government of South Sudan and the citizens to determine the development projects that are being done. So we believe we, we, we are working together. We only differ on this issue of how to define the RAS group. On the role of the Ugandan, men, Ugandan forces, Ugandan troops have been in South Sudan since 2008. And these two troops were a part of what we call the African Task Force. Actually, uh, supported and encouraged by the African Union, supported by the United States at the time, where they had also contributed a contingent of, of, of Marines, which were actually helping help in locating the, the position of the Lord Resistance Army leader, Joseph Coyne. So these troops were there to eliminate the presence of Lord Resistance Army in the regions, both in Uganda, 
South Sudan, DRC, and Central Africa. And these troops, Ugandan troops came in 2008. They were based in Central Equatoria. After we got rid of LRA from Central Equatoria, they moved into Western Equatoria, where also the LRA elements were pushed out, pushed out from the DRC. Now we know this, 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 this exercise is not yet complete. So the Ugandan troops cannot withdraw until we complete to identify where the Lord Resistance Army is, and that is Joseph Kony. The day Joseph Kony is caught out of our region, that is the day Ugandan troops will go. So they are there for that particular function, as said by James, I agree. Now, how did they come in in the last? They came in in the last incidents because we wanted to secure important infrastructure in, the, in South Sudan, and that was Juba Airport, because the United States, United Kingdom, European Union, Kenya, Uganda, Sudan wanted to vacate their citizens from the airport. We didn't have enough troops to take care of that. We didn't have the capacity, but the Ugandan troops had the capacity. They protected the airport, and I'm sure some of the members sitting in this audience were comfortably airlifted out of Juba Airport with the guarantee of the Ugandan troops. The second responsibility was actually to protect the economic line that is the Juba Numele Road, a 200 kilometer road where most of our goods come in from Uganda and from Kenya. We could not allow this route to be interrupted by the rebels. And so, and again, Uganda could not vacate all their citizens by air. They had to bring in a huge fleet of buses so that they could take them by land. So that road needed to be protected. How did they end up in Bor? In Bor, we have an airstrip where the Americans also wanted to vacate their citizens and other the countries like Kenya, we needed relief food to be brought in. And the airstrip in Bor is actually a part of the whole town of Bor. And that's how the, actually the Ugandan troops progress into Bor area. And of course, being there, the rebels were still there shooting. There's no way they will avoid not shooting back. That is the second thing. The third thing, as an independent state, that James said, we, we, we can make friends. With any, and you know friendship among nations, according to international law, it is just like marriage. When you get a girlfriend, you agree. You marry each other. If you don't agree to marry each other, you can cohabitate, isn't it? You, you spend so many years doing so many things which look like for a husband and a wife, although you are not legally married. I'm sure most of us here have gone through that. I'm not excluding myself, but I hear all of us that all of us have done that. This is not so, a polygamy thing. <laughs> it is not polygamy, of course. It is not polygamy. So there are bilateral relations which, which, which are done between the states. South Sudan is no longer a rebel territory. It's not a part of Sudan. We are an independent state that can make friendship. By the way, we have now 12,000 foreign troops in our country brought in by the UN Security Council. And they've recently asked us to bring, that they would want to bring in another 5,000. We have agreed. We have troops from, 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 from Japan that are there. We have troops from South Korea. We have troops from Bangladesh, name it. We have also within the United States some experts helping our army in its transformation, the British military helping sort of thing. This, this, this is, so if you ask us to let the foreign troops go, and this has been our question, are you asking us to, to let all these people? We cannot afford to tell UN Security Council, you take your people out of here. We don't want to fight UN Security Council. We're just a small country at the middle of the continent. And I think this, this needs to be understood. So the issue of Ugandan troops, we, can, we have guaranteed with the Sudan, that like James Courtney has said, what you have said is absolutely true. I was sent to Sudan recently by my president, and I met President Bashir. And we told him, there are no troops at your border. We will not allow Ugandan troops to be at the border, which can actually co cause the uncomfort position of the Republic of Sudan. These troops are in a limited manner. And now with the peace process going on, Ugandan troops will have nothing to do with our internal problems. They will definitely go back to Western Equatoria to continue hunting down the LRA together with the SPLA forces, together with the DRC, unless the Americans withdraw their intelligence unit, which was there to provide information to these troops. I think we need to put this, this into context. We must also appreciate what the Ugandan troops have done in securing a safe, actually uh, uh, taking off of, uh, uh, of, of foreign elements who were in South Sudan. And, and we are happy there is no single foreign citizen that has been killed in this trouble. I think that's a credit. And, and we must appreciate that. Then finally, uh, the, the other thing which was raised, uh, the, the reaction of Sudan, as I've said, we have uh, guaranteed them. They may not be satisfied, but we have guaranteed them that there will be no any involvement. Secondly, 
Uh, the foreign troops they speak of, are, these are the rebel movements in the Sudan, like those of Darfur, like Southern Brunei. We have expressed very clearly we are not in a position to support any rebel group against the regime, against the government in Khartoum, because we have bilateral interests. We have economic interests. Our oil is passing through Khartoum. We cannot jeopardize that. This, every country has its own national interest. We have assured Sudan that we are not going to do that. As long as you stop not supporting militia against us, it is a tit for tat. We will not support militia against you. What remains is the trust and the guarantee. Thank you. Thank you. Thomas, can we turn over to you, please? And yeah. Your reactions and views. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, mine is going to be very short, really. Uh, yes, I mean, he said about the big, uh, the big tent. Sorry, Thomas. Yeah, please, I think yeah. this is important for us to clarify. Yes, yes. Of course, uh, President Salva Kiir has a big heart in, in the way he deals with these things. He's very forgiving. He, his, his interest is to see that the people of South Sudan come together. And that's why he had to give amnesty to the groups of Paulino Matip who were being financed and supported by Khartoum to disrupt and cause instability in South Sudan. That's why now seven uh, suspected uh, detainees of having participated in the coup have been released on bail. Where in Africa, where do you get somebody suspected to have involved in a coup can even leave the next morning? I think we have also educated Africa, by the way. We have said even if you suspect somebody to have made a coup, you don't have to kill that person. Arrest that person. Let the due process of the law go on. I think this is a lesson that South Sudan, as a young country, two years old, is trying to do. Imagine your own babies wetting the baits. You don't throw them out of the window. It can wet the bed today, tomorrow, well, we'll grow up. Give us the chance to grow up. We will definitely resolve this issue. So really, this policy will continue. Uh, to tell James, there is no way uh, we, we, uh, that policy of forgiveness, of reconciliation, of pardoning one another, you know, of living in peace, uh, is, 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 as in Christian beliefs, he said, do to your neighbor as you would want to do to yourself. You, you, don't, you, you don't want to be happy all the time, and then you want the other one to be unhappy and give a blow to that person. It's a feeling enshrined in our traditions, in our culture. Yes, we can quarrel. Yes, we can fight. But there is a possibility of reconciling and having peace. So the big turn is still there, James. If you want to get into it, you're welcome. <laughs> OK. Thomas, yeah. over to you. Thank you. OK. Thank you very much, and I really appreciate the, the speech given uh, by the minister, uh, Dr. Barnaba Marial, and you know, uh, educating us and reminding us of the, the history of South Sudan and how we got here. Um, uh, my contribution will be small, it will be short, and basically uh, I'm speaking as a general observer, analyst, but also as a citizen, citizen of South Sudan. Um, well, the current problem that we are facing in South Sudan now is an absolute disaster. It's a disaster for, for, for our people. It's a shattering disaster. It's a big shock because after struggling for more than 40 years, two wars that have been mentioned already, and at, fine, at last obtaining our independence, the last thing uh, we were expecting so soon after independence, so soon after celebrating and voting together as one family that, this should be, that this, uh, such a disaster should happen. Uh, but it doesn't mean we are giving up. Uh, the struggle continues. We still strongly believe in South Sudan. South Sudanese still believe in South Sudan as much as they did on that day when they voted. Uh, and, and, and therefore, this is a big setback, but it's also an opportunity. The opportunity may be to start to look into ourselves and looking at what, has, you know, what went wrong. Um, it's also an opportunity um, uh, to start to see how we can correct these things. It's not, it's not to be used to, uh, uh, as a vehicle where the elite would sit uh, in isolation from the people and broker peace again and everything goes back to normal. That's not what South Sudanese want. Uh, we want it to be a reconciliation uh, amongst the people in general and also a beginning for new transformation. It's, not also, it's also not an opportunity for those who don't have great wishes for South Sudan, either historical or new. Uh, there are people who don't believe in the, in the agency or the agenda of South Sudan. Uh, uh, there are people who think that uh, it's a conspiracy, international conspiracy, is a Western consp conspiracy led by the United States against maybe, you know, uh, uh, powers in the Middle East 
or whatever uh, reasons might be. But South Sudan is nothing to do with that. South Sudan is, is a homeborn uh, agenda, and South Sudanese believe in the process of South Sudan. So really, this is not an opportunity for people to start revisiting the idea of South Sudan and say, actually, was it a good decision or not? This is not the time. As the minister has actually told us, it is an opportunity for people to say, OK, what does South Sudan need? We don't need to be told off. We don't, we don't need to be uh, suppressed or destroyed or diminished, but we need assistance. Uh, and in what way do we need assistance? I think uh, the government has done a good job, has done as much as they could, but it wasn't a perfect job. It's a job that can be improved. And I think this is where this is a bit of opportunity uh, for other elements within the community to be involved in this peace process so that it's a wider process and that the ordinary South Sudanese voices would be heard. And this is actually the real meaning of democracy. Um, for, particularly, I'm interested in, you know, uh, and the minister, to, to be true him, to, to be true and fair to him, has mentioned them, you know, the churches and the chiefs, the traditional chiefs, who have a lot of traditional mechanisms that sort these things out. It's not alien to the Nurse and Dinka and many other South Sudanese communities that these wars happen. Maybe, okay, it's much more exaggerated now because we have uh, big, big, strong armies that are holding very destructive modern weapons. But traditionally, uh, South Sudanese fought, but they had mechanisms of coming back together. I think that's why it's essential, very, very important, that the chiefs should be involved here. And also other uh, elements of uh, uh, civil society, trade unions and professional associations. And uh, there will be areas that we are going to look at, areas that haven't gone very well through our state building process. I think South Sudan is exposed in these areas, and we, we, it might need to ask help from outside, but of course from its position as a sovereign state. It's, we're not saying uh, South Sudan should be handed over to the UN, as some people have been suggesting, or to the United States, no, however good, uh, well-wishing the US might be. Uh, no, this is going to be probably an arrangement between a sovereign state and other individuals or organizations or other states. Along the lines, for example, particularly in the area of financial control, it has been a disaster in South Sudan that uh, the oil resource that was supposed to go for everyone. Uh, ideally, if you want to think about it in, in a fair sense, since oil is a natural resource for South Sudan, it should be calculated by you know, to, uh, using the... Uh, formula of 250,000 bottles a day divided by eight, you know, how much do you sell that in dollars, and divided by the 8 million population, everybody should have the dollars and put them in their pocket. <laughs> yeah? But it doesn't work like that. We need institutions and we need to trust people to, to run them. And hence, it's in the hands of the government of South Sudan to do. But it hasn't, done, hasn't worked very well. I'm sure most of the people in the government of Sudan are well intended. They are very good. But we have uh, an element that has ruined it for us. Uh, and, and this has alienated a lot of people. It has frustrated a lot of many South Sudanese that our resources have been wasted. That's one. There is also the element of elitism. When the revolution was there, when the SPLM was fighting, the people and the army and the leaders were together. Garang and Kir and Riyad Machar lived side by side with South Sudanese, ate with them, and went to bed with them. Uh, at the moment, uh, people are isolated in, you know, more or less a gated community in Juba. And there's a feeling that people have been separated, that a new elite has been created. Uh, and uh, the elite doesn't care. They, they are self-seeking, self and they're not looking after the rest. So uh, many ordinary citizens feel they're alienated from their, their government. They have no relationship with their government. And this could lead to a lot of problems. It has man been mentioned man in many other areas as well, especially if you consider that 70% you know, uh, of these uh, uh, isolated uh, citizens are young people who are unemployed, uneducated, uh, but obviously have aspirations. And you know, what are you going to do uh, to, if you're not going to do anything for them? They are going to decide to do something, uh, which obviously uh, we can now see, especially in the case of the White Army, is a good example of how you can use a small generation, a small, uh, uh, a, a big number of very young people to try and, and, and destroy things and cause havoc. So this is the issue of elitism. It has to be addressed. The question of the fail of the justice system. There is no justice system in South Sudan. Well, there is, but it's not working. Yeah. We have judiciary, we have, the, uh, we have the police, we have the uh, prison service, but it's very poor. I, I, I went and lived in South Sudan for seven months, and people get arrested who should not be arrested. People uh, who have uh, committed uh, mistakes are left loose to, to get away with it. It's, it's, it's an environment where people have come to decisions that there is no justice in this society, so it's open for everyone. 
uh, we, we need help here. We need to look back into this. And South Sudanese have to get together uh, and sit together and, and, and talk about it. Freedom of speech is another thing. Uh, freedom of speech actually is seen as a threat in South Sudan. But actually, it's part of development. The more uh, we can speak freely and contribute freely and write freely, the more we are going to, to expose the misdemeanors amongst, amongst ourselves. What is going wrong? Who is doing the wrong things? And therefore, bit by bit, we grow and we move forward. But if you try to see these people as troublemakers and put them in a corner and, and you know, isolate them, uh, then that's going to be a problem. So it's an opportunity to, to, to improve these things and, and move on. And the last thing I'm going to mention as well is the question of meritocracy. Uh, the way things have, opportunities have been given, whether there are business opportunities, whether there are, there are job opportunities, there has been no merit in them. Uh, uh, the word merit in South Sudan actually has become a dirty word. It's, 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 it's a threatening word. So therefore, opportunities are found because you know, people have connections or people are related. It's not unique to South Sudan, but South Sudan cannot afford it, you see. So uh, I think it is an opportunity for us to start getting together, widen the discussion. It's not going to be between RIAC and, 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 and the government of South Sudan. And really, I'm not saying here that there's an equivalence between uh, the government of South Sudan and the rebel movement. We understand that it's an issue. And of course, as long as the peace process is going on, it's up to them uh, how it's going to be concluded. But we are saying that widen the scope, include other South Sudanese there, uh, so the new voices could come in, and we start again, and we start rolling. Uh, and that's my point. Thank you. Thomas, thank you very much for uh, some very useful points eloquently made. Um, we are running behind schedule, but I don't want this meeting to end without giving some members of the audience an opportunity to ask a question. Uh, and then at the end of that, we'll come back to the panel for final, for final comments. Um, first, Pastor Kashmai, it was the gentleman here in the third row. If you'd like to stand up and the, wait for the microphone to reach you, and then identify yourself, if you, if you would, please, for the benefit of the minister and the other panelists. Uh, good evening. My name is Sisto. I come from South Sudan. Uh, I will not go so much into what uh, the minister has, uh, has told us this evening, but I will have one question on the issue of uh, the suspect, as you prefer to call them. Uh, in relation to what is going on in Addis, because that this meeting has to do with finding a, a, a political solution to the, to the problem in South Sudan. About two days ago, the government came with a statement saying that the political prisoners, as we all know, but the government preferred to call them suspects, if they are allowed to go to Addis, they will be called rebels. I thought uh, all this effort that we are making has to do with finding a, a political solution to the problem we have in Juba. Of course, uh, the rebels are saying that if the prisoners or the, the suspects are not going to uh, participate or they are not allowed to participate, then they will also boycott the meeting. Uh, is there a solution to this? because without the participation of the other intellectuals of South Sudan, including the churches, the civil society, the religious people, etc., do you think we are going to find a final solution to this problem or we are only looking for to solve a partial problem to this problem that we have in South Sudan? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, if you just pass the microphone to the gentleman across the aisle there, Lucy. If you keep your hand up. Thank you very much. My name is al Haj Paul, and I come from South Sudan. Uh, I'm grateful for the minister for having given a very uh, nice, enlightening speech and all the other discussions. My question is to the minister. The government of South Sudan constantly stresses that it is a democratically elected government. Now, since Sudan came into existence on the 9th of July, South Sudan. South Sudan came into existence on the 9th of July, 2011. There has never been any elections held in that country. You, the government that is not now in power, which you represent, sir, was elected in the United Sudan on, in April 2010. Your mandate 
actually expired on the 9th of July 2011. You were supposed to have held a meeting which was agreed with all the parties. There was supposed to be an interim government which SPLM, SPLA, and your party usurped and took over the power. How can you call yourself a democratically elected government? Thank you. Thank you. We'll take two more. The gentleman on the aisle again, just behind you, Lucy. And then, yes, him? Yes? And then you, yes, sir, as well. Yeah. My name is Michael Amoa from SOAS. Your I've name? Michael Amoa from SOAS. Michael Amoa? Yes. I've got two very brief questions, one to the minister and one also to James. Um, we recently we saw um, your president, um, Salva Kiyamaya, did, um, complaining about um, Ban Ki-moon's officials misadvising him. Uh, in what way do you think that the UN has actually misunderstood or misrepresented your government? And to James, you did say that the West does not buy the coup narrative, but you don't tell us why. What really, in your opinion, happened? Thanks. Thank you. And then, yes, you, sir. OK. Uh, my name is Warile Benjamin. Uh, I'm a South Sudanese. I, will, I work in Juba. I just came here before the incident. Um, I'll uh, just. My appeal, uh, uh, Honorable, uh, the minister seemed to, to always look outward to the problem and the solution. And uh, we are talking here of an estimate of 1,000 to 10,000 lives that are lost, yet to be confirmed. Uh, one of the organizations, the FAO, they have came out with a report last week that seven million of our people are food insecure. We want peace, yes. But we cannot be looking at problems. We are always selling South Sudan as a resource base that should be given time to become, and it has led us to this. Honorable Minister, I want to go back to Juba to do my business. It's not about what happened who is doing that, but you guys need to bring peace. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't see any peace, if you, uh, political peace, if you're not looking at the economic independence of South Sudan. What brought us now, Ugandan troops in South Sudan, Bashir, Sudan, is threatening to come in. Uh, lastly, yesterday, Ethiopian Prime Minister is also concerned is because all these years, you guys, you don't look at the economy, at the basis, people as a base of economy. The private sector in the South is all about the same people. So when are we going to talk of nation, nation building instead of always state building, state building? Thank you. Good. James, there was a very specific question f for you. Perhaps you'd like to tackle that. Thomas, if there's any couple of points you wanted you. Um, Come in on that. No, okay. I have no comment on this. Okay, and then we'll end with the uh, yeah. the minister, I think. But James, quick. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd say that it's not just the West, actually. Also, the African Union, I think, hasn't condemned the coup. You see that Ethiopia calling for detainees to be released. Uh, their argument, I think, is that well, we can all agree there was a political crisis. We can all agree there were tensions. Uh, it's clear, I think, that Salva Kiir uh, and his supporters had a majority within the National Liberation Council on December the 14th, December the 15th. Then you get a shootout uh, amongst different factions of the Presidential Guard on the night of the 15th. The position, I think, taken by uh, Western diplomats and others is that there isn't uh, credible evidence that has emerged uh, linking a detailed plan by Riek Machar and the other people accused of the coup of being behind what could have been a, a military flare-up or, uh, uh, to the other extreme, an attempt by Salva Kiir to get rid of his rivals. Um, so that, I think, is, is the basis of the reasoning. To ask my personal opinion, uh, I wasn't there at the time. I haven't seen evidence produced by the government uh, that is convincing enough to this point. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but it hasn't been produced in the public eye to justify the narrative of a coup. 
Minister. Oh, well, you uh, thank, you, thank you very much. I, I will first respond to a few questions that have been directed to me. First is the question uh, raised by Sisto, in which he said uh, that these people, uh, especially the suspected detainees, if they go uh, to Addis, they would be called rebels. Well, because the narrative that these uh, so-called, uh, uh, I mean, the suspects who have been released, the seven of them, they have said clearly to the EGAD countries that, in fact, they are not a part of what Dr. Yak has done, that they don't support the violence that he has gone into, and they are not a part of that. Therefore, if they go to Addis, as we were told by EGAD, and the EGAD, the facilitators, the, 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 two, the three days before, one day, a day before I came over to Britain here, they came to Juba, they visited me in my office, and they said, actually, the, the negotiating table is not going to be the usual table we know when two parties negotiate, that it is going to be a tripartite type, type of thing. The government on this side, the rebels on this side, and then what he calls the reform group. It is like the, the, the story of uh, around, the, around the world in, 20, I mean, in 80 days, that the reform group will sit. So they are going to sit as a reform group. Sisto is not me. It's not the government of the Republic of South Sudan. That is the description that the Igad countries got from the seven who were suspected to, to be a part of the coup, of which they said they are not a part of that. And that if they were to participate, they were to participate as a, a group on their own in order to help bring about peace in, in, in South Sudan. The civil society organized participation is there. We have started the reconciliation processes. The reconciliation process is important. They don't have to be a part of the negotiating team. It must be an agenda organized across the country so that the civil society organization, the church leadership, the elders, the chiefs, as Thomas was saying, all these people and will bring across the whole society of the Republic of South Sudan so that the reconciliation, the forgiveness of one another, the way forward can be discussed in that forum. So they are a neutral body. They are not a part. They are a body interested in peace. And you can, you can see the impact of the truth and peace reconciliation that President Mandela did in the late President Mandela did in South Africa. It is a different forum. So the society there is system. And, and, and if you are, uh, and I think you are, you are, if, you are, if, if you consider yourself to be a part of that, why not go and join them in order to help bringing peace among your own people rather than freezing here in London? Now, <laughs> about Haj Paul. Haj Paul said on the 9th to 20th of July, no, Paul, when the elections were done, in 2010, April 10, it was done under the transitional, the interim constitution, which gave the life of parliament five years. That this parliament shall stay five years, and that is by April 2015, new elections will be done. So what happened exactly after the, the, the referendum was done, the parliament had to sit in order to endorse the continuation of the interim constitution. That we use. So these people, this parliament, is legal constitutionally. Now there is the constitutional reform that is going on. Now this is going on for the last two years now. It is now going to the states where the general public will give the re reaction to the permanent constitution we are supposed to rectify to replace the interim constitution, which is actually the constitution being used and running this country. So it is a legal status, uh, my good friend. The fact that I'm a member of parliament now on that election beyond 2011 is legal and constitutional. So, so, that is, so they are not there uh, illegally. They have been constitutionally put right. Uh, and sometimes people begin to assume uh, that as if there are no lawyers in the Republic of South Sudan. There are wonderful lawyers trained throughout the world, trained in this country. Old Bailey, you know, not, not even in the streets of London. They, 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 they are professional, they know their job well, they know what constitution means. So, so, so now, uh, Paul, I can assure you. Secondly, there is the, we, I'm telling you, we have 25 political parties now. And there is the freedom of association which is enshrined in the constitution, you see. And that's why we, we're saying any citizen is free to register your party and do your campaign. Uh, and, I, and, and what Thomas was thinking, that, the, uh, that there's no freedom of the press. No, there is freedom of the press. 
People are free to say what they want. We have newspapers all over the place. Up to now, I haven't had one newspaper closed down like you hear in other countries. What more freedom do you want? Somebody to hang himself definitely will be arrested. But I think freedom of press to say what you want to say within the comp without agitation, without incitement. Of course, even in this country where there is freedom of press, if you get the racist coming into this country and say something which is, the British government believes is inciting, like some racists who come from Poland and other places, I understand the other day, he was bundled into the plane and asked to go. This, this, would you say there's no freedom of press in Britain? That is true. And I will tell you a story, family story, Adam. When I came, one of my twin boys rang me. And he said that, oh, you have just good luck. You know your team has just butchered uh, Everton. They gave them, I'm, I support Tottenham Hotspur. <laughs> so he said, they have butchered uh, Everton 5-1. So you are lucky. Because he has got a different team he supports, and that is Arsenal. I had wished that the Arsenal was butchered. But he said, well, so I said, but he said, Dad, you know what I noticed in it? You know, Everton was trying to say some anti-Semitic statements. And I said, what did they say? Since you are a politician, I better let you know. I said, what, what the hell did they say? They said these Everton were singing that, oh, um, the first thing they said, they saw, oh, the big noses are somewhere there. And they meant because it, where they come from is mostly a Jewish territory. And they were saying things like, and I would want ladies here to forgive me if I say this. Uh, they were saying, oh, you know, uh, that Tottenham, they, have, they don't know what the forest skin looks like. You understand me? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I'm apologizing to, to the ladies. It's trying to say what the Jewish custom is. You know, I, I think my fellow South Sudanese know what I'm talking about. You know. That they, that they don't know what the, they don't know what the forest skin looks like. So I told him, what is anti-Semitic about that? That is the truth, because they practice a different thing, like it happens in other parts of Africa. Is, now, would you arrest these fellows simply because they say this pronouncement? Is it not a free society? But the police was concerned in this country. Because they thought that this was an anti-Semitic type of pronouncement. It was, but I'm sure these people might have been trying to joke and make a laugh out of the, out of the fact that they were defeated and they wanted to, you know, to throw back. So really, the freedom of press relates to the conditions. Fine, I, then finally, Michael Amwa, you rise officially with our position uh, with the UN. We have 12,000 troops, United Nations troops in South Sudan with the permission and agreement of the Republic of South Sudan. We are also members of the UN system. And in addition to this, they are bringing more 5,000 troops. Yes, we have got a few issues, which are administratives and which are related to the agreement between the government and the United Nations. But we believe these differences can be resolved without, without fight. Warile Benjamin, you are welcome to come back home, my, my fellow citizens, because uh, look around us. Look what is happening in Central African Republic. Look what, is, what happened in Angola. When they were just one week, they got their independence, and the, the fight broke out between UNITA and the MPLA. And that continued for 27 years. See what is happening in, in, in Somalia. See what is happening in, in, now in Mozambique. Renamo has gone back again to the bush, and there's fighting there. Look what happened in, in Kenya one of the countries to believe to, believe to be democratic during the post-election violence. Look what happened in that. Look at the DRC. 50 years now, it is still fighting. But we should, be, we should look forward because within 30 days after our internal conflict, we have been able to sign an agreement. We, there is a light at the end of the tunnel which shows that we are moving toward resolving our conflict within 30 days. The rest of African countries is 20 years, is 25. Why should we not think that the things are calm? And in fact, within Juba, it was the first two days, the 15th and the 16th, where you could have had the gunfire. But from that day onwards until today, it is calm. So, so why come and do your business? Uh, I know you have been doing good business in South Sudan. My, my encourage, and my guarantee, I can tell you, if you come now, your business will, uh, will uh, beam. Now, we're really on the issue of food insecurity. 
Uh, food insecurity, the policy of the government has agricultural program. <coughs> food insecurity is across Africa. We on our part, we are doing our best in order to resolve the issue of food insecurity. That's why we are inviting investment to come in. As I said much earlier, the country is indoors with the resources. Come and do your best. Entrepreneurship is allowed. A private sector development has to be encouraged. And for us to encourage it, this is why the government wants peace, so that there is stability, so that there is no investor who can go and pour his money in a territory where there is shooting all over the place. Nobody will do that. That's why we say, let us have peace and stability so that we can begin to develop. So, Warile, I think, I think you come back, you are a part of that solution. You are not a referee. You are a part of the game. Your, your being here contributes negatively to your being not being in South Sudan. So I would encourage you, you can come back to business. If you want to fly there tomorrow, please do so. Like I will be flying back the next two days. There is the Ethiopia and Sudan thing. I thought I had said I just came from Sudan having been sent there by my government. What governments do among themselves, Benjamin, when people are trying to reassure themselves, you, you promise the country that we will not be able to allow any hostile activities from, from this, this side, from our side of the border to the other. It is assurance, it is diplomacy, it is relations. We, we are not going to, to lie down in Khartoum and say, look, oh, almighty, we have not done anything. There. But we have to assure them that we want our national interest and your national interest to be protected. So we have given that assurance. And I have said the context of the Ugandan troops in South Sudan. They will not be a part either to continue causing any problems, participating in our own fights with own, our own family inside. We can assure, we assured the Khartoum government that there will be no way we will allow Ugandan forces to go anywhere near the, 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 the South Sudan, Sudan border. We have given that assurance. The two presidents are talking to each other every day to assure themselves. So this, this is diplomacy. It has to be done. Uh, the, 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 the things which are raised by, by Thomas, um, that, um, that I wanted to, to, uh, to talk about, is the, which I have answered, the issue of the freedom of the press, is God is enshrined in our Constitution. There is no way in which you can prove that there is freedom of press unless it is in the documents of the country which are, which are respected. Yes, it is a setback to all of us, and that's why we are working to try and bring the process of reconciliation and start. The assistance to the government uh, in terms of development we have, we have our vision, 2040, the type of South Sudan we want to see. A country which is informed, which is educated, which is developed, which is free, which is democratic, which is just, which is this is the country we are all looking for. And each one of us as citizens of that country, including our government, should work for that vision. It's, it's a long vision, and you have to do it little by little. And I think the commitment of having peace and stability is important. Yes, traditional mechanisms, we are going to use that in the reconciliation processes which are there. They have within its authorities the sovereignty and financial. You know, with the oil money, now we, we have an account that the government has opened for future generations. The oil money is not all being used just for the people who are there now, you and myself and the rest. There is an account which is put aside, and this is one of the things we gain through the experience of Norway, that you must put something for the generations of tomorrow. Because oil is a curse, as we have said. So I believe, yes, uh, well, when rebels take over who are not used to money, the first few years you will mismanage it because uh, there is no question about it. You need to train capacity. You need to have accountants. You need to have financial management properly done. So if there was mismanagement in the beginning of the year, that was there. But now I can assure you we are, the government is accounting every dollar that we are getting in that country. Our accounting system has improved. We have got assistance from the neighboring countries, from international partners who have been helping us in order to, to make sure that our, our finances are properly managed. And that is a process you gain by time. Uh, in the beginning, yes, there was, there was mismanagement because uh, South Sudanese thought that they had a lot of money. And after all, they were not even bothering about money for the last 20 years of the war. We we're conducting war without money. And suddenly, here you are, there must be a budget, the budget plan. And I, and I think now, uh, Thomas, I can assure you, uh, the, the accounting now is different from what you imagine. And the oil money is being managed properly. And I believe that if you go to South Sudan today, you will see there's are changes are happening. 
in terms of roads, in terms of housing coming up, in terms of, of, of the capacity of the civil service. And that's why, finally, to tell you, uh, to share with you, ladies and gentlemen, what South Sudan needs is help, not punishment. And I think this is important. The goodwill, the international goodwill, needs to have that in its forefront. And secondly, the government of the Republic of South Sudan is committed to peace. Reconciliation processes whereby our people can live together again. The element of ethnicity and tribalism will have to be fought in a manner which is acceptable to all the 64 ethnic groups. It's not an issue of Nuer and Dinka. As I told you before, uh, if you look at it, you cannot say it is a Nuer on the government side. Who is the chief of the staff of the armed forces? He's a Nuer. Who is the speaker of the National Assembly? He's a Nuer. The three, the three states, Jongle, the governor is a Nuer. Apanai, the governor is a Nuer. Unity state, the governor is a Nuer. Within the government, there is a large number of Nuer citizens within the government of the Republic of South Sudan. So this idea of trying to break it, that Salva Kiir is heading a Dinka thing, and on this side, Nuer is the, I mean, because uh, Vice President is a Nuer, yes, he's using the ethnic card. That's why he's being told that this is a dangerous route to follow, that it is not correct. But the government side, is a representative of all the ethnic groups of the Republic of South Sudan, including the, the Nuer ethnic group in that country. We are building a nation, and therefore we must be encouraged to build a nation where actually the identity as a South Sudanese is more important than your tribal character. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I feel as though we've only... I feel as though we've only really scratched the surface of this, this, this subject, a very dynamic, fast-moving situation in which the stakes for a very young country are, are very high. I'd like to thank the audience for their uh, continued uh, attention. I think the fact that everybody has stayed, although we have overrun, is a, is a measure of the interest in this subject. We at the Institute will continue to monitor uh, developments uh, in South Sudan very closely, as will the wider international community. I'd like to invite the audience to join me in thanking our panelists for their uh, engagement and uh, commitment to the discussion here this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you.